Lest the Triumph, a memoir by Barry Dominic Graham, narrated by Peter Baker. This audiobook is profoundly dedicated to my beloved son and daughter, Jonathan Christopher James Graham and Hannah Helena Margaret Graham. Also to all those others I love and to those I have loved and lost. These words were spoken by James Graham, 5th Earl and 1st Marquess of Montrose, Earl of Kincardine, Lord Lieutenant and Captain General of Scotland, 1612 to 1650. But if thou wilt be constant then, and faithful of thy word, I'll make thee glorious by my pen, and famous by my sword. I'll serve thee in such noble ways, was never heard before. I'll crown and deck thee all with bays, and love thee evermore. Everyone has a story to tell. To write a book based on that story is far from easy and therefore relatively rarely done. There is much to consider when translating one's life into the written word. I soon realized that offending people would be virtually impossible to avoid, especially if the whole truth were to be accurately told not that those in question do not deserve such exposure, but for the sake of my own integrity and sanity, some names and finer details have unfortunately been withheld. Not many people have the time and opportunity to write down the highlights, lowlights, and essence of their life, and therefore I am very grateful to have been blessed with both. I would like to add that the book title, Lest the Triumph, is not only appropriate itself, but is also the anagram of an alternative title. Introduction Through love, joy, hope, disillusionment, trial and tribulation, this is a journey of revelation and awakening. The experiences and lessons of every life possess profound relevance and value, whether funny, sad, shocking, or bizarre. This transatlantic memoir promises laughter, tears, insight, and hopefully a small measure of wisdom. Or so it says on the back of the book. I shall, however, endeavor not to disappoint or to renege on the aforementioned promises. Chapter 1. Genesis. Everyone, I hope, has those precious and vivid times in their lives which they profoundly treasure the memory of. They are the comfort blanket with which we envelop ourselves within when life becomes difficult to bear. Despite all I may say, I believe that I have had my fair share. It has been said that wisdom is simply the end product of pain which is healed. So, bearing that in mind, a small measure of it is likely all I'll be able to manage. It all began in a relatively small village called Winnipegosis, which is nestled along the south shore of Lake Winnipegosis, embracing the banks of the Mossy River in the Canadian province of Manitoba. My mother, Nora Josephine Graham, nay, Kearney, had been a highly trained public health queen's nurse and midwife in Scotland when she applied for the same position in Canada. She was described by her siblings to have been a fun-loving and vivacious young woman when she left Scotland, but this was not the person who eventually returned. She was based at the Crera Hospital, where I would ultimately be born, 
on July the 19th, 1962, which was operated by the nursing Sisters of St. Benedict. The hospital served the general community, which included the Cree Nation Reserve, on whose land the hospital apparently stood. It would seem she was extremely happy there, for a while at least. Since being the origin of my middle name, I can only conclude that my mother was perhaps closest to a sister Dominic, Mary Cecilia Colano, who was born on October the 9th, 1917, in Brandon, Manitoba. I am grateful for the fact that I recently had the opportunity to revisit the place of my birth. I actually know very little of what occurred during this early period. There was a great deal of obfuscation, embellishment, and exaggeration as to the finer details. Basically, for my mother, it was true love at her first sight of my father, Dennis, who was the owner-manager of the Woody Pegosis Hotel and Beer Parlor, he being someone neither codependent nor genuinely empathetic by nature. She apparently pursued him until finally succeeding in initiating a relationship. It would seem that she decided that pregnancy would secure a permanent bond between them, hoping matrimony would ultimately follow. As a result, my father undoubtedly felt pressured into marriage by family and peers, just as my mother had hopefully anticipated. Unfortunately, tactics such as these rarely deliver the desired effects, and in light of this realization, my mother began to psychologically unravel, sadly becoming ever more dependent on prescription medication, almost certainly, sadly, enabled by her colleagues. Despite being a midwife by vocation and profession, she was obviously not personally blessed with maternal faculties, and immediately sent word back to Scotland asking her younger sister, Monica, to urgently come over and assist. Meanwhile, the nuns did their utmost to care for both my mother and myself. My father was obviously extremely preoccupied with the running of his business at this time, but I'm sure his parents, my grandparents, Isabel and Adney, assisted appropriately. As I inferred earlier, the finer details of the entire situation are unclear and of a delicate and disturbing nature. Versions of the story differ significantly and profoundly from either side. Needless to say, the entire unfortunate series of events could be suitably summed up by the word fiasco. I was hauled from the womb two months prematurely via caesarean section and promptly installed in an incubator. Probably being a cold turkey drug addict, ostensibly rejected by my mother and having scarlet fever, I was then circumcised, commonly done in Canada. Happy bloody birthday. At six months old, ultimately and inevitably, my parents parted company. I was left in the custody of my mother, who, upon her return home to Scotland, proceeded to suffer a serious nervous breakdown. Until my mother finally got back on her feet, she stayed with her parents, Thomas and Agnes Kearney, in Yoke, Glasgow, sharing also with her two sisters, Margaret and Monica, and youngest brother, Anthony. When she eventually returned to nursing and regained her independence, she moved to Castle Milk in Glasgow, a poor and troubled area at that time. I was to remain thereafter in the care of my aunt, Monica, et al. I was named after my father's younger brother, Barry Dale, who had tragically died by drowning in the White Mud River at Westbourne, Manitoba, Canada, when he was just a child, six years, eleven months, and four days, after falling through an old disused wooden bridge on Saturday, April the 24th, 1948. The river current was extremely strong that year, due to a heavy spring thaw. Little Barry was found after six days of otherwise failed searching, in a formerly searched area, beneath the branches of a submerged fallen tree close to the bridge from which he had fallen. Through the mystic powers of a First Nations native shaman who had stayed overnight in the area. Something my grandmother, Isabel, in particular, never got over. My aunt, Monica, who became my practical mother, was also carer to my grandmother, Agnes, who, being a traditionally Victorian woman, 
was rather domineering and formidable, as were her two sisters, Harriet and Alice. I ultimately tended to feel more like an obligatory lodger rather than a desired occupant, I have to say. I was, however, furnished with all the practical care and attention one could hope for, despite having to endure my grandmother's rather warped sense of humour, which invariably resulted in me being thumped when my objections were raised. I'll refrain from going into fine detail, but suffice to say, she manifested some grotesque habits and twisted mental aberrations. Nevertheless, between my mother, aunts, uncles, etc., I felt extremely cared for in every way that matters. I would see my mother fairly regularly, all in all, but had to get used to the fact that whenever a love interest should be on the scene, I was inevitably relegated. I was brought up to respect and honour without possessing the slightest right to question or object, and to a great extent I believe that this was not overly unreasonable, especially when I witness many of today's children and their inherent sense of entitlement, disrespect and ingratitude. I would like to now relate what I know of my Graham family origins. My father provided me with the following details. My great, 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 great paternal grandfather was Michael Graham, who was born in Coven Island in 1740. He emigrated with his family to Canada in 1775, settling in Coven and the county of Durham, Ontario, and later in the town of Middlebrook, Ontario, whose only son, Robert, married a Nancy Bedford. I would like to now focus on my paternal great-grandparents, Rowena and Bridgeland Brock Graham. Bridgeland Brock was a pioneer farmer in Manitoba's Rosedale Municipality, coming from Ontario at the age of 10 in 1879. His father, Joseph, my great-great-grandfather, was born in Millbrook, Ontario, in 1821, the son of Robert Graham and the former Nancy Bedford, who had come from Boston, Massachusetts, with their parents in 1789. They settled in Nova Scotia and later in Toronto. And Jane Earls, my great-great-grandmother, was born in the county of Vermont, Ireland, in 1831. Her family journeyed to Canada that same year. They settled in Toronto after two weeks travelling. My great-grandmother, Rowena, was of the family McNaughton. Her father was Malcolm McNaughton, born in Dumbarton, Scotland, in 1818, relocating to the New England state of Maine in America, becoming a schoolteacher. My great-great-granduncle, Jack McNaughton, was born, like myself, on July the 19th, but almost a hundred years earlier, in 1863. Joseph Graham was employed with the Dominion Land Office in Peterborough, Ontario, when Sir John A. Macdonald, his good friend, came back to power in 1878. He was appointed to a position in Fort Edmonton, a trading post of the Hudson Bay Company in central Alberta. His wife Anne, nay Earls, was ill and unable to travel, but upon her death in June the following year, he and his surviving sons, Joseph, Adney, Clarence, and Bridgeland Brock left and arrived in Winnipeg on July the 27th, 1879. They spent one year in Winnipeg while Joseph worked with the Dominion Land Office. That winter was, at that time, referred to as the coldest on record. Plans were then changed for Joseph, and instead of going to Fort Edmonton, he was sent to Gladstone, Manitoba, going by steamboat as far as Portage. Two teams of horses were hired to freight their belongings. At the end of the first day, they reached Westbourne. Apparently the trails were terrible, with Westbourne being a sea of mud and water. The stopping place was poor and crowded, as so many were coming into the Red River country. Bridgeland Brock recalled having to crawl in on a cot with an old chap who was a perfect stranger, but whom he would meet again many years later, living in a little old shack on the southeast corner of Lake Dolphin. The next morning they left for Gladstone, getting stuck repeatedly in the mud. That night they slept out under the wagons, with the wolves howling around them. They made Gladstone the following day, moving into a house on the side of the trail. 
they had seen the Red River cart trains being loaded and leaving Winnipeg for the west. Now they passed their door. The old trail ran through Gladstone and past their house. First, nation people travelled back and forth all summer. Their camping ground was just across the river. In the spring of 1884, the land office at Gladstone was moved to Minidosa, Manitoba. Clarence and Adney, the two older sons of Joseph, had joined up and gone to the Louis Rio Rebellion, travelling by train as far as steel was laid, somewhere near Regina, then marching on to Fort Edmonton. They returned safely in 1885. Homesteading, Joseph and his son, Bridgeland Brock, bought and settled on the north half of 161515, north of Nipawa in 1888. The McNaughton family had come from Lachine in Quebec and homesteaded the half section where Mountain View School had been built, just north of the Graham farm. Acquaintances were made and progressed, and in 1895, Bridgeland Brock and Rowena Mary McNaughton were married. They started their married life in the little log house. Joseph Graham died on July the 12th, 1900, at the age of 80 years, and was buried in the Riverside Cemetery of his family residence. In 1945, Bridgeland Brock and Rowena celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary and thereafter retired to Nipawa. Seven children had been born and raised. Bridgeland Brock had served Rosedale Municipality as councillor and had been chairman of the Mountain View School where his children had attended. He passed away in March 1960 after a brief illness in his 91st year. Rowena Graham passed away on February 5, 1971, at Nipawa in her 96th year. Anyway, that's a brief summary of some of my Graham family history. I actually know very little about my maternal side of the family, I regret to admit, other than the fact that both my grandparents, Thomas and Agnes, had extremely strong ties with Ireland and their Irish heritage. On Easter Monday of 1916, my grandmother Agnes and her sister Alice were in the Dublin GPO when it was taken over by Patrick Pierce and other leaders of the 1916 Rising. Curiously, I had an uncle Bertie who was in the Royal Navy and was the personal monsieur on HMY Britannia to King George V. Anyway, time to move on. Chapter 2 Diamond Days My maternal grandfather, Thomas, sadly passed away when I was around two years of age. I can actually recall being held by someone and watching as the ambulance departed from our Holwick Street home. My next memory takes place in our sitting room, and again being held aloft only this time in order to kiss the forehead as he lay in his coffin. It is said that he simply looked as though he was sleeping, and all trace of his cancer was gone. It was said that his lustrous, thick silver hair appeared like silk. Like many, he was gone too soon. Shortly thereafter, when new housing became available in the form of high flats, we moved to Plain Street in Scotstoun West. It was an excellent place to live at that time, a real community with good neighbours. This is where I would spend the next twenty years. Unfortunately, my general circumstances had made me a rather insecure child. Whenever my aunt would go out, I would invariably hover around the sitting-room doorway, waiting for her shadowy silhouette to appear beyond the thick, translucent glass panel of our front door at the end of the long, dark hallway. All my fears would leave me when I saw her face, my nanny. I would be visited by my mother about once a week, and despite there being an essential lack of maternal bonding between us, I was always more than happy to see her. My Aunt Margaret would come and stay on her days off. She was the one least likely to chastise me for being a pain in the ass, providing I surrendered my favourite chair, of which she would repeatedly remind me she'd paid for, among many other items. <laughs> 
everything was very ritualistic, traditional and cosy. My uncle Antony would also visit on a regular basis, primarily to pay his contribution to the matriarchal household, usually on a Friday night, bringing his eldest son Paul. Paul was about two and a half years younger than me and was my closest cousin and playmate. As always, there were some profoundly negative aspects of my childhood and beyond, the darker of which I'll address in a later chapter. Suffice to say, the one consistent bane of my life was my entire journey through the education system, or rather, indoctrination system. I detested almost every miserable minute of it. I did have a few nice teachers, but overall, they were mainly a vile bunch of bastards who preferred inflicting humiliation and pain to imparting knowledge and enlightenment. I was never a disruptive, cheeky or disrespectful child, so I could never justify their pious hypocrisy and gratuitous cruelty. Nevertheless, there were many diamond days with warm, gentle memories, which I will always treasure. Christmas had always been my favourite and special time of year, followed closely by Halloween and Guy Fawkes Night. Although desires and gifts were much simpler and affordable then than they are now, my family always seemed to make it a magical time. My Aunt Monica would scrub the house and polish the porcelain china contents of the dreaded glass cabinet. My grandmother would always glower and regularly bestow death threats upon me should I ever venture too close to the corner of the sitting room where this bloody thing stood. Even her bingo treasures were a no-go area. Bloody fish and things made of swirly coloured glass. Absolute tacky shit. Anyway, Christmas. Monica, accompanied by Mario Lanza's Christmas songs, would put up the decorations and the ancient three-foot silver tinsel tree the night before my Aunt Margaret was due to arrive. Then, the following night, Margaret would ceremoniously plaster it with a hundred heirloom balls and a million coloured lights. Would all then sit and appreciate. Apart from the excitement and sheer joy of Christmas Eve itself, when other family members would visit and deliver presents, etc., it was the general feeling of safety and unity that truly fed my soul. I knew only too well never to be a pain in the ass on Christmas Eve. If Christmas Eve should fall on the Monday, then my little granduncle Andrew would visit, it being his usual evening to do so anyway. He would always be wearing his big tackety boots. He'd have a cup of tea and a slice of cake, smoke almost tobacco-free roll-ups, most being on the carpet, watch the television, chew his false teeth, and moan about the price of things, then abruptly leave. Not being much of a gift-giver, due to him being as tight as a tadpole's kiki-winker, one year he handed me a substantial fistful of change, totally blowing my mind. Christmas just couldn't get any better. Andrew, Hugh, and John were my grandfather's surviving brothers. They also had a sister, my grand-aunt Sarah, or Sadie, a true angel of charity, compassion, and mercy. Sarah Molloy, nay Kearney, adopted my beloved, now late and lamented cousin John, as an infant. Also leaving us too soon, the lives she touched with her grace would thereafter darken beyond all recognition without her. I have some profoundly special memories of being taken on outings and holidays by my close family, but I think the most outstanding are the weeks I spent in Bransby in North Yorkshire, at the Roundtree Country Mansion, when I was around eight years old. My mother had attained a summer post as a personal nurse to the 90-year-old daughter of the late Joseph Roundtree of Roundtree Confectionery in York. My recollections of this magical countryside paradise seem almost like dreams to me now. Waking up in the mornings next to the ivy-framed open window of my bedroom with the sound of cuckoos, crows, larks and finches was, to say the least, euphoric and sublime. Back then I was obsessed with ornithology. I would climb any tree, wall or drainpipe in order to view the contents of a bird's nest. Ashley, the gardener of the Roundtree estate, found me to be extremely aggravating, due mainly to my climbing exploits and making his tennis-court conifers skew with. Myself, 
and the children of estate staff members gave him no shortage of things to whinge about. One negative memory, however, is when I was significantly clouted by my mother for getting mud all over my Sunday clothes. She didn't accept my explanation of being chased by a cow. In 1974, when I was around 12 years old, my mother purchased a caravan situated on a small campsite in the Scottish northeast coastal village of St. Cyrus. Our close friends, the Brady family, had previously holidayed in a cottage near the Nuke Caravan Park and had recommended it highly. Upon my first visit to St. Cyrus and beholding the untouched, stunningly beautiful beach from atop its majestic volcanic rock cliffs truly blew my mind. This place would become the bittersweet focal point of my life thereafter. I will elaborate later. My mother generally permitted me to take a friend along on holiday. This is just as well, due to the fact that when, without male company, my mother would rarely, if ever, make it past the three-day mark before taking to her bed with a migraine or gallstones, virtually turning the caravan into a semi-mobile morgue with eye masks, earplugs, drawn curtains and compulsory silence. I actually don't remember eating. Luckily, my friends and I were always out and about and so didn't really mind her little foibles too much. I have wonderful memories of exploring, fishing and climbing. It was my Eden and, at that time, my idea of heaven. Much has changed now. Houses now stand where the caravans once did. As with my home at Plain Street and so many other precious people and places, the site is now gone. Sometimes I wonder if any of it ever happened at all. Endeavouring to remember the precious moments of our lives is our only shield against the harsh and bitter winds of living. I realise now more than ever that gratitude for the blessing of happy days must supersede the inferior emotions we are all invariably plagued with. As time goes by, I'm increasingly aware of just how much I miss the family, friends and pets who are no longer around me. But mostly I realise just how much I actually loved them. Here's to Diamond Days. Chapter 3 Lost in Love Love indeed brings us face to face with ourselves. Like most, my own experiences have been profound and torturous. I have always been extremely idealistic, too much so. I have always sought perfection in the world that is imperfect, and thus created the majority of my own trials, disappointments and pain. I was most definitely a victim of circumstance, and as a result expected more from the future than the past. My natural disposition and mindset being undoubtedly related to the experiences and insecurities of my life, left me unable to countenance or even imagine the concept of casual relationships. In everything, I always have been all or nothing, with none of the half measures I felt I'd essentially always been subjected to. I adhere to the fact that I had no choice as to this state of mind. My intolerance of anything I perceived as at all tarnished, has made my life and that of others difficult, to say the least. The curse of my life has been such. I have always struggled with abandonment issues, which have been far from imagined, but to unconditionally demand a permanent commitment from someone is an extremely tall order. Without relaying too many specifics, the primary theme in my life has been the early loss of my now wife, Helen. I first met Helen and the rest of the Murphy family whilst on holiday at St. Cyrus with my mother and cousin Paul. She was nine years old and I was twelve. Her parents had also purchased a caravan via a mutual acquaintance of my mother. Obviously there was little connection between us back then. The family scenario had always drawn me like a moth 
to a flame, and I became a regular visitor to their home in the janitor's cottage of St. Aloysius Playing Fields in Milliston, which stood opposite Hoggenfield Loch. Initially accompanied by my cousin Paul, the Saturday visits were the highlight of my week, but like most things in life, gradually became less frequent until I eventually drifted away. Five years later, in 1980, I received a letter and photograph from the Murphy family whilst in the process of being medically released from the Canadian Armed Forces at CFB Cornwallis in Nova Scotia due to having almost died from double lobar pneumonia, acute bronchitis and an erroneously administered yellow fever inoculation. A few weeks prior, I had been inspired to write to the family once again, mainly due to having very few people to write home to, as well as being abjectly homesick and lonely. My brief military experience was extremely traumatic and significant. I will describe my adventures in boot camp in a later chapter. I was immediately struck upon seeing Helen, then aged 14, in the photograph with the rest of her family. To my eyes, her image virtually lit up and rose from the paper. My only thought thereafter was to get well, get home, and renew my relationship with the Murphy family, Helen in particular. Having recently turned 18, I had never had a girlfriend. I'd never even kissed a living soul, family included. I was dressed to kill and looking the best I could on the day I first returned to Milliston. The family had been moved to a nearby new Barrett housing estate, so it took me a bit of time to find their home after disembarking the 38A bus. As I approached their door, I was overwhelmed by nerves and apprehension, but that quickly dissipated when Mrs. Murphy opened the door and welcomed me in. I was there for about an hour or so before Helen and her sisters arrived. I was again overcome by nerves, but the moment I saw her, I knew that I would never be the same again, and that my heart was hers. I succeeded in not revealing my enchantment to her or her family. It was apparent that they all seemed extremely impressed by my visit, which was a relatively new experience for me. I, however, never possessed the ability to read behavioural signs or have the confidence to presume a girl was in any way interested in me. My former regular Saturday visits were reinstated, combined with simultaneous family visits to our caravans at St. Cyrus. Those were, without doubt, the happiest days of my life. As the weeks passed, Helen and I became increasingly close. Confidence was always a severe problem for me, and it took seven months for me to finally attempt to kiss her, albeit apprehensively. Our feelings for each other were immediately confirmed thereafter. We had each been needlessly harbouring the same fears of rejection. We shared the happily ever after kind of love, as true as love can be. When in Milliston, we would walk in the fields beyond the estate, usually crossing the old quarter-mile railway bridge. The only thing that marred our relationship was the ever-growing blatant jealousy of Helen's elder sister, a strained siblingship at best. She proceeded to follow us wherever and whenever possible, whilst calling out taunts and jibes. She was also persistently whinging to her parents about us. Her jealousy was, however, understandable to a point. She possessed neither Helen's looks nor grace of motion. Primarily, her issues stemmed from the blatant favouritism shown towards Helen by her father. Our three-year age difference was also a factor to be frowned upon. There were many storm clouds gathering, for more reasons than I intend to mention. Suffice to say, varied jealousies disguised as morality and righteous indignation would ultimately lead to our destruction and bring about an abrupt, cruel and merciless end to our dreams of a future together. We had privately exchanged our own vows of marriage before God and each other, regardless of the obstacles we faced. Helen was quickly cajoled and deceived by promises of understanding and compassion, until revealing all that had passed between she and I. Thereafter, no effort to deal with the situation was made other than to exact a revenge so vile 
and absolute that two lives would henceforth be fundamentally shattered forever. I had never felt such love before, and to have it torn from me with such blinkered cruelty, without wisdom or grace, was unbearable. I will never forget the wry smile of satisfaction on the face of Helen's elder sister as she stared at me in my broken and helpless state. On the evening of our separation, in shock and heartbreak, I wandered to a familiar area of the St. Cyrus clifftop, which looked down on the old nether kirkyard with its ancient gravestones and monuments, which notably included that of George Beatty. At one point I began to manifest an audio hallucination of people approaching, and became momentarily convinced it was Helen and her family coming to tell me that everything was going to be okay. Of course it wasn't, and nothing would ever be okay again. As much as I tried ways to reach out to her, there were elements put in place to prevent me from ever being able to make direct contact. For the weeks to come, I initially wanted nothing more than to die. All I could do was endlessly replay in my mind the final moments we shared together when, just prior to departing and returning to Glasgow. She managed to exit her caravan unseen, just long enough to throw me a note wrapped around a small bottle of perfume, which stated how much she loved me and that she thought she was going mad. As I stood and watched as their car drove away, taking with it all my hopes and dreams, something vital and integral in me died, never to be restored. I carried her note in my wallet for years, until it withered and fragmented with age. For the next two and a half years I remained alone, still hoping that one day she would come back to me. Despite spending several months in Canada, I prayed every day that Helen would somehow make contact, but all in vain. Sadly, both Helen and I would eventually meet and marry other people. Nevertheless, over the years, I would still continue to make the occasional pilgrimage to the quarter-mile bridge, climb to the top and look out over the wasteland to her house beyond, watching the ghosts of two young souls walking hand in hand, innocent, happy, and entirely lost in love. I used an image of this bridge for the front cover of the book, not only because it best symbolized the journey of my life, but primarily because it will always remind me of a time and place that will dwell in my heart and soul forever. In a way, I am still standing on that bridge. Little did I know then that fate would one day contrive to reunite us almost twenty-one years later, but the two people who would meet again would not and could not ever be the same two people who were so cruelly parted. I know now that there were particular underlying factors external to Helen and I that would have inevitably made our union impossible at that time. Whatever shortcomings my mother may have had maternally, I will always credit her in the extreme for her understanding and support during my darkest days. Helen's parents saw it to me that my mother's caravan was evicted from the site, which obviously cost a great deal to relocate, but she never berated me for it or ever cast it up, a fact which I'll never forget and be always grateful for. The great irony is that back in 1981, Helen's father told my mother that he didn't care whether I lived or died. But then, even after the initial continuation of his vendetta, 21 years later, he suddenly began to apologize and completely reverse his position. I was always kind and respectful to him. At no time did I make apparent or divulge my true feelings towards him. For good reasons, however, I found it increasingly and profoundly difficult to be in his presence. These feelings were due to my gradual realization of the immeasurable amount of damage his actions had inflicted on Helen and I, both individually and collectively, as well as the incredible amount of baggage we were now left to carry. 
Many people have been affected by the collateral damage, but rather than see the entire tapestry and acknowledge the true original perpetrators, some apparently prefer to blame Helen and I exclusively, resulting in our relationship being vilified, scorned and sullied once again. How a love which was so essentially pure and innocent could be so continuously persecuted, harshly judged and penalized, will perpetually remain beyond my powers of comprehension. In 1999, I began having recurring and disturbing dreams about Helen whilst I was residing in northwest Canada. Unknown to me at this time, Helen's mother had just passed away prior to the onset of these dreams. I was eventually compelled, with my then wife's blessing, to attempt written contact. I had no idea if Helen was even alive, let alone being long married with three children. The letter arrived at her old home in Milliston, only to be promptly thrown in the garbage by her father, but nevertheless, ultimately and strangely, retrieved. The unimaginable orchestrations of fate took over entirely. Despite being over two years later in 2002, Helen and I were eventually reunited. The relationships with our respective partners had basically reached their natural conclusions. Thus, after our divorces were finalized, our civil wedding took place on May the 27th, 2007. According to the hypocrisy of the religions we had both been married by and encumbered with, one way or another, since birth, the only true and recognized marriage in the eyes of God for each of us would remain that which was with our previous spouses. Not even a simple blessing would be permitted or tolerated. Leslie Ann, who had been my partner for 18 years and mother to my son, Jonathan Christopher James Graham, was more than gracious about the entire transition due to her own particular agenda. But Helen's partner, whom she'd been unhappily with for the same number of years, made the process as ugly and protracted as humanly possible until he also wished to remarry. He actually married the day after the decree Nisi was issued, which was long before we could make any such arrangements for ourselves. Throughout and after much false propaganda, duplicity and treachery, courtesy of certain members of Helen's family, in conjunction with that of so-called friends, would pervade every aspect of our lives to the core. In 2003, once the die was cast and wishing to endure no more wasted time, I had a prior vasectomy procedure reversed, through which we were blessed with our daughter Hannah Helena Margaret Graham in 2005. It is more than strange that, whilst parted, Helen and I both married people with the same forename, were with them for the same length of time, and both had our first-born children in 1988. Also, it was the illness and death of both our mothers which ultimately reunited us, basically facilitating and sealing our reunion. In the end, needless to say, what could easily have been such a precious and beautiful union between two young people was fundamentally destroyed, corrupted and tarnished, due only to actions resulting from the most malignant and myopic reactions possible. I can only hope that the shattered remnants of that crushed romance and their significance will one day be enough to help me overcome the bitterness, cynicism and retroactive jealousy of my fractured heart and mind, restoring to us the happiness and joy which was lost so long ago. As much as I like to try to justify my state of mind, by whining about the ample injustices of my life, during my rare serene moments, I know that I am psychologically damaged. The mind can be a cruel adversary. I state in my defense that I have never consciously intended to cause emotional pain to any living soul and have always been free of guile. I do believe that anger and cynicism are primarily the armor of sadness and pain for those unable to deal with such. On this level of reality, love is pain, always has been, and always will be.
We may not understand reasons or lessons whilst in the myths of this life, but one day, perhaps in the next, we certainly will. When all is said and done, even when remorse is withheld, to forgive those who have afflicted us with turmoil and suffering, however callous or mercenary, is absolutely necessary if we ever hope to transcend the damage endured and the effects thereof. We must endeavour to reconnect with our higher selves. In conclusion to this chapter, I would just like to add that music is most definitely the great healer, and for Helen and I, the early love songs of Air Supply, Genesis and Neil Diamond, together with the music of John Barry, Jason Wade and John Denver, have created the soundtrack to our first and last love. The comfort they continue to bring from the precious memories they evoke are without doubt truly priceless. Like teardrops in the ocean, our love was lost in time, banished and remembered as some imagined crime. A first love true and gentle, all seek but rarely find, denied and torn asunder with angry eyes gone blind. Restored at last divinely, our poem finds its rhyme, the essence of the song we dreamed is lost no more in time. The circle is completed. With hope all hearts will heal, and tears of years be wiped away by first love proved as real. Chapter 4 Undertow I mentioned in an earlier chapter that I would address some of the darker aspects of my childhood, so here goes. A while after returning with me from Canada, my mother was re-employed by the National Health Service as a public health nurse and midwife. She was living alone in an NHS-provided flat in Castle Milk, Glasgow, which was a rough and deprived council estate lying south of the city adjacent to Rother Glen. At that time I was around two years old, thus memories are somewhat vague. One incident which stands out in particular was the time when my Aunt Monica had brought me for a weekend visit to my mother. Monica never relished the thought of venturing to this part of Glasgow and must have been convinced by my mother that her fears were groundless. It was either the Friday or Saturday night when a commotion was heard outside. I must have been in bed and awoken with fright. My memories are rather patchy, but I clearly remember the sound of loud banging at the door and a male voice pleading for sanctuary. Probably my mother's door was chosen because of some signage or notification posted that it was a nurse's residence. I remember being lifted by my aunt and carried to the hallway, where my mother was in the process of shouting questions to this chap through the front door. As I understand it now, it would seem that he had been walking his girlfriend home and for whatever reason was attacked by a local gang. He was screaming that he was still being pursued and that they'd cut one of his ears off. I remember a great deal of blood oozing under the door and a general sense of my aunt being terrified out of her wits. My mother was obviously in nurse mode as she appeared composed and controlled throughout. She quickly let the guy in and locked the door again, then grabbed a towel and held it to the side of his head to stem the bleeding. The gang were now outside the door, violently kicking and punching it while yelling obscenities. Suddenly, we heard them run down the stairs and realized that the police who had been called earlier must have shown up. An ambulance arrived for the injured boy, and that was that. As you can probably imagine, my aunt never returned to the Castle Milk flat. Most disturbing of all, when I was three years old, after my mother had been moved to another NHS residence, the location this time was Milton, yet another quiet and picturesque hamlet in Glasgow, situated north of the River Clyde. Possibly not having quite as many junkies and murderers as Castle Milk, but it was undoubtedly up and coming in that respect. To be honest, at that time at least, 
It was a pleasant enough place with nice enough people. My mother still took me to stay with her for occasional weekends. During one of these visits, she had her best friend over for a drink, chat and sing-song. Still being only three years old, I was upstairs in my mother's bed, sleeping, with the bedside lamp on as usual. I've no idea what time it was when I was awoken. The husband of my mother's friend, who had previously been at his own night out, had arrived at our house to join the party. He was a Glasgow policeman. My memory of what occurred is once again rather vague and dimly lit. Apparently, after being upstairs to visit the toilet, he decided to enter my mother's bedroom. After some drunken small talk, he told me that my mother had insisted that he give me an operation. He proceeded to pull back the bedclothes and remove my pyjama bottoms. In an attempt to save my life, he began to molest me. Shortly thereafter, he stood up and approached the head of the bed whilst unzipping his trousers. He informed me that if I resisted or told anyone about what he was doing, that I would have to be put in prison for disobeying a police officer. He was obviously standing in front of the bedside lamp, but despite the increased darkness, I could still see the outline of his genitalia heading towards me. Even at that age, I had been extremely influenced by my mother's hypochondria and fear of germs, to the extent that, besides all obvious objections, and in spite of his verbal threats, I refused point-blank to allow this object anywhere near me. Threats of any kind have always evoked belligerence and defiance in me. I think that he must have been shouted for as he abruptly left the room. The following day, I was in the back of my mother's car when I revealed all which had taken place the previous night. I don't recall her specific reaction, but before I knew it, I was standing with her in the office of the Catholic Secular Canon at St. Augustine's Church. She demanded that I repeat to the canon exactly what I told her earlier. Even at that age, I recall feeling humiliated and abused. I believe that her guilt for failing to protect me actually superseded common sense, as this ordeal only served to enhance the trauma. He was somehow aware that my mother's friend and her paedophilic husband had two young female children and that they were all of the Catholic faith. After hearing all the sordid details, the canon offered his verdict. He announced that it would be wrong to destroy a good Catholic family by revealing this information and or pursuing any legal redress. I'm not too sure what happened next. The event was, thereafter, never spoken of again. It was assumed that, being so young, I would simply forget. Sadly, there are some things that insidiously affect our lives forever. This was to be no exception. To have one's innocence stolen at such an early age is not only tragic in essence, but profoundly damaging in effect. Needless to say, my mother subsequently lost her best friend permanently. The horrors of school aside, I think that the next most disturbing event was my enforced visit to Canada when I was almost ten years old. I had never consciously met my father or grandparents until this time. Being as insecure as I was, the thought of being sent 6,000 miles on my own to spend a month with relative strangers was, to say the least, horrifying. I was continually instructed by my mother and aunts that it was my duty to go. Having always been furnished with extremely unpleasant stories and remarks about my father, it was baffling to me that the opposite was now being suddenly promulgated. However, the day arrived and I went. I was well looked after, and despite my fears, all went well. I was primarily in the care of my grandparents whilst in British Columbia. I saw my father on occasions. We went fishing once and did some other relatively fun things. Since no one else had been in my particular position in their own lives, I suppose that it never occurred to anyone just how gut-wrenching and heartbreaking it would be for me to finally have the father I'd always yearned for, only to lose him again after four weeks. I cried all the way home. After two years, 
I was sent over to Canada once again, and so on. It would eventually become clear to me that I was being used by my mother, at least, as a pawn in some sad, twisted game. On my second visit, I'd been introduced to my father's friends, the bishops. We spent time at their amazing home on the beach. Mrs. Bishop was a very nice and attractive woman, on whom I had my first emotional crush. Being extremely shy, I think I hid the fact quite well. On my return to Scotland, I wrote her a letter filled with trivia about my hobbies and favourite things. To me now, it was obviously the work of a young boy, being entirely innocuous and harmless. But for whatever reason, my father thought my mother had written it and posted it back to me, together with a hideously insulting letter. I initially thought that this was directed at me and was duly devastated with embarrassment and bewilderment. Late one evening, soon after, I was in bed when my aunt called me to the phone. It was my mother. She was in a rage because she'd just hung up on my father after he'd accused her of sending the letter and yelled at me to immediately telephone him and vindicate her, calling me colourful names, when through being mortified and shocked, I refused. The experience of my first crush on a woman had resulted in nothing but insanity, vileness, and unbelievable humiliation. My mental state was continuing to deteriorate through anxiety and various complexes. By the time I reached puberty, I was crippled with panic attacks due to OCD, dissociative and depersonalization disorders, an identity crisis. I had regular appointments with an NHS psychiatrist and was prescribed with various psychotropic drugs. I was also a cutter. I thought I was going mad, so as an object lesson designed to dispel this particular fear, my doctor surreptitiously orchestrated an event which would leave me waiting in a hospital ward with severely mentally ill patients. It worked, but it was a hellish experience no less. I apologise if this chapter is coming across as nothing more than a prolonged whine, but in my defence, rightly or wrongly, the aforementioned events were particularly significant to my formative years and would become milestones in my life. I would never really achieve appropriate or intimate relationships with either of my parents, which has left me with an unnatural emptiness. There are definitely aspects of myself which have never grown. I have succeeded in encasing the lost child in myself with various layers and forms of armour. However, he is safe and guarded. The myriad of betrayals which have plagued my life, especially by those whom I most loved and trusted, have provided me with the strength and fortitude to cope with most eventualities. Many veils of past deceit have gradually been lifted and almost dealt with. I think that I've always been a convenient scapegoat for certain types of people. Overall, I have been hugely blessed. My father has provided my family and I with security and a reasonably comfortable life and has proven that he has some form of love for me, I think. Whilst I may regret the infliction of certain circumstances and events, I am mostly grateful for the people in my life and treasure the memories I have shared with them. I thank my wife Helen and my children Jonathan and Hannah. I also thank my first wife Leslie Ann for caring for me and sharing the sufferings of my mind for so long. She found me when I was broken and lost, and planning to become a Catholic missionary priest, picked me up and then carried me through eighteen years, until the day we mutually and tenderly said goodbye. I will always love her. As the tides ebb and flow, so do our lives. We are all on a journey and need our interactions and experiences with each other to complete it. In the end, everything has reason and purpose. My negative experiences were merely that, more than some and less than others. Maybe life can sometimes be seen clearer through a broken window, and love through a broken heart. <laughs>
But one thing above all is true. Love never dies. It only transforms. Chapter 5 Papillon There is no story without some kind of tribulation and trial. Feeling trapped and chasing the delusions of perceived freedoms are part of the human condition. As Nelson Mandela once said, there is no easy walk to freedom anywhere, and many of us will have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death again and again before we reach the mountain top of our desires. Freedom, as with happiness, is a state of mind. It can never truly be purchased in the material sense, but I believe it can be otherwise achieved. I no longer strive for happiness, but rather for serenity and contentment. Anyway, enough pontificating. Continuing the theme of feeling trapped and imprisoned, for me the education, or rather the indoctrination system that I endured for twelve years, did indeed qualify as a form of incarceration. I was always referred to as a dreamer, which is now apparently a symptom of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, an affliction with which I have also been diagnosed. I tend to lean towards the fact that I found almost all of it mind-numbingly tedious. On the day I finally left school, having a job with my uncle already lined up, I unceremoniously exited a side gate, turned, gave it the finger, and never looked back. I promised earlier to regale you with the adventure of my brief sojourn in the Canadian Armed Forces back in 1980. After yet another failed attempt to bond with my father, who obviously had no perceivable interest in me, I travelled about 900 miles from Kelowna, British Columbia, to my uncle and aunt's residence in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Not wishing to outstay my welcome, I decided to join the Canadian Armed Forces and see the world. After completing all the required medicals and exams in Saskatoon, I was duly accepted to ultimately train as a sniper. I was soon informed of my date of induction at CFB Cornwallis in Nova Scotia. It didn't take me too long to realize that I was doing this for all the wrong reasons. I left Prince Albert early in the morning. At 3 a.m., five aeroplane flights later, I was leaning across the side of a ferry whilst crossing the Bay of Fundy. I'd never felt quite so alone and scared before. After docking at Digby in southwestern Nova Scotia, a prearranged taxi hurtled me to the base. Upon arriving, I met up with some other new recruits. We were all left waiting with our luggage in a large empty room. After about two hours, we were met and escorted into a large hangar and instructed to line up against the wall. The silence was abruptly broken by the entrance and yelling of a group of MPs waving machine guns, no less. Obviously, the intention was to scare us silly. It worked. They were obsessed with possible drug possession and proceeded to have us completely searched while screaming incessantly at us. Eventually, we were designated to our respective platoons. Most of the NCOs were French-Canadian. We were marched to our assigned barracks in order to choose a bunk. The previous recruits had obviously been instructed to trash the place before they left, as there was blood smears and various other stains on the sheets. We were then ordered to clean the place and prepare for inspection. Also, more disturbingly, we were ordered to write a letter home, stating that we were in seventh heaven and having a ball. Not only was this a million miles from the truth, but the mere act of writing such dictated lies was psychologically damaging in itself. I was traumatized and terrified. I couldn't eat or do a poo for the first week. The CAF training techniques were a combination of British, American and French Foreign Legion. Knock them down and build them up, was the agenda. Aside from the extreme physical endurance, the worst aspect was sleep deprivation. If lucky, we would get about one or two hours sleep each night. 
When the day was over and the lights went out, we were all huddled in the toilets cleaning, polishing and ironing. I was utterly crap at ironing. Due to the vast quantity of starch required, I kept burning the armpits out of all of my shirts. My wages were mainly spent on uniform replacements. Just to give you an idea, it took at least two hours to make a bed to inspection specification and 40 minutes just to iron a pair of underpants correctly. After the first two weeks, through being soaked and queuing up outside buildings for lessons, information films and inoculations, I had the flu. In the weeks to come, this developed into acute bronchitis and then into double lobar pneumonia. I initially insisted that I not be hospitalized for more than two days, as I would be recoursed, which meant beginning training from scratch. Regardless of recruiting office assurances to the contrary, physical assaults and punishments were a common occurrence. The verbal abuse was also more than I had anticipated, but some of it was quite amusing nevertheless. By the ninth week, I was barely able to speak due to continuous coughing. The coup de grace was an erroneously administered yellow fever inoculation. I was not meant to be given this injection, but had failed to be issued with a note to verify this fact. Without a note or chit, no one listens. Upon returning from the mess that evening, I suddenly couldn't breathe and promptly collapsed in a heap. That was ostensibly the end of my military career and my future as a sniper in the PPCLI, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Whilst I was at boot camp, my Aunt Monica and mother had arrived in Prince Albert, visiting from Scotland, and staying with my uncle and aunt, Tommy and Madge Townsend. It must have been distressing for them to have to travel over two and a half thousand miles to CFB Cornwallis, subsequent to being informed that I was in critical condition and possibly near death. Meanwhile, I was getting asleep at last. I must have been asleep for days, as I remember very little. I turned 18 unconscious in a military hospital bed. Having passed the dangerous period and no longer critical, I awoke to find my aunt and mother by my side. They stayed for about three days, before returning to Saskatchewan. Upon my release from hospital, I was offered the opportunity to return to the base at a later date and repeat basic training. I respectfully told them to sod off. My final week was called the out routine. I was in a new barracks with other recruits who were also being ejected. It was as close to a sense of freedom as I'd ever experienced. I could roam the base at will, eat and sleep any time I liked and still keep in contact with my former comrades. The hell of the previous two months had suddenly transformed into heaven. In spite of all the negative aspects, I was privileged to meet and befriend many great characters and was happy and proud to have genuinely earned their collective respect, especially that of those whom I least imagined. I was honorably released and traveled back to Prince Albert. The official stand taken by the Canadian Armed Forces was that I had been ill due to a pre-existing condition. More government lies. All I could now think about was getting back home to Helen. After several weeks, I was able to return to Scotland. The rest is history. I have had a great many jobs in my life but mainly due to those certain individuals with whom I've had to interact with and work alongside, my overall experiences have invariably been detestable and soul-destroying. Freedom is only perception. Days of tears to come. A darkness dwells within my heart, that final song of songs. The requiem for love that's lost from where it e'er belongs. That fear which haunts my dreamscape, where doth beat the final drum, which ushers in my life's love loss in days of tears to come. Barry Dominic Graham Chapter 6 Soul 
don't believe what your eyes are telling you. All they show is limitation. Look with your understanding. Find out what you already know, and you will see the way to fly. Jonathan Livingston Seagull Richard David Bach, American writer and philosopher, born 1936 I would describe myself as a Gnostic deist, as I have the profound certainty of a creational source without belief in any religious dogma. I have spent the majority of my life searching for truth. It is no accident that orthodox religions condemn and persecute heretics. Only liars and the willfully deluded fear dissent, and only a lie needs to be enforced by a threat. If God were the ocean, then we are the individual drops of which it consists. Separation is the great lie. If one truly believes that God, Allah, Jehovah, the great architect, is omniscient and omnipotent, then surely it has to follow that he, she, it, had an absolute awareness of all future genocides, tortures, persecutions, and hypocrisies that would occur should the creation of religions be in any way inspired or endorsed. This would suggest a very sinister deity indeed. God has been described as jealous, vengeful, and angry. I would imagine that true blasphemy would be the attribution of such base and vile human emotions to the creator of all things. It takes very little research to discover that all the major religions stem from the subservient and hierarchical belief structures of the East Semitic Akkadians, later known as the Assyrians and Babylonians, and the Sumerians of Mesopotamia. They all have their origins in celestial worship or astrology or astrotheology. Their essence also encompasses the Maseroth or Zodiac. For example, it is no coincidence that our three major religions or astro cults manifest in Israel. Is Rael, I S R A E L, Moon, Sun, and Saturn, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Even their individual symbols and days of worship echo this fact. Bulls, golden calves, etc., allude to the age of Taurus. Ram horns, sheep, and lamb references signify Aries, and all that is fish-related denotes Pisces, or leading us into the current age of Aquarius. Whatever the original purpose and intent of religion, the fact remains that it was contorted and corrupted into a system of social control designed to divide humanity and prevent awareness of individual spiritual sovereignty and significance. Religion keeps groups in hostile camps. Without it, divisions would blur with passing generations. Children would adapt to new times, mingle, intermarry, forget ancient wounds. But religion keeps them alien to one another. Anything that divides people breeds inhumanity. Religion serves that vile purpose. By their fruits ye shall know them. I believe that the true key to understanding God and creation lies in quantum physics. Quantum theory is the theoretical basis of modern physics that explains the nature and behavior of matter and energy on the atomic and subatomic level. The nature and behavior of matter and energy at that level is sometimes referred to as quantum physics and quantum mechanics. The basics are not as complicated to understand as you might think. An effort to research this subject will open up the mind to infinite possibilities and wonders. It has taken me 40 years to understand that life is merely a school, essential to spiritual progression. Gross material lessons cannot be attained on higher realms. This is the only level where the good, bad, and ugly are thrown together in order that the gift of free will can be exercised in a polarized scenario. The bottom line is that most, if not all, religions give people various obfuscations, diversions, and excuses to avoid what is absolutely essential 
if we can, whenever possible, be unconditionally kind, compassionate, empathetic and selfless towards others, whether human or animal. In spite of our own personal sufferings, we have passed the test of life. Our ultimate reward is to consciously ascend back through these spiritual realms on our way home to the source, being individual but becoming one with creation. We are only truly separated by our degree of spiritual understanding. There is nothing greater or lesser. We are all each other, all drops of the same ocean. Disguised somewhat as a children's story, everything one needs to know and understand can be found in the metaphorical essence of Richard Bach's channeled literary masterpiece, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. This book, with the film and music thereof, have helped me endure the darkest days of my life. Chapter 7 George Beatty of St. Cyrus There can be nothing more cruel in this world than finding the truest love only to have it wrenched from you. The wind will hold her secret and deep in a cold tomb in the old St. Cyrus kirkyard. This raging pain of lost love will finally be silenced. George Beatty Scottish lawyer, poet, scholar, philanthropist, and radical, 1786 to 1823. The George Beatty Project was initially inspired in late 2011 and officially founded in 2012. I have had a deep connection with the St. Cyrus area since 1974, when my mother purchased a caravan on a local site. Despite having been vaguely aware of George Beatty from former visits to the old nether kirkyard, it wasn't until my cousin John Malloy and myself happened, coincidentally, to be there on the exact day of the 188th anniversary of his death that we felt compelled to focus on him. He tragically departed this world on Monday the 29th of September, 1823, by pistol shot in the old nether kirkyard, next to the grave of his two young sisters and brother at the southeast corner, where his monument now stands. We became engrossed with certain anomalies regarding what we knew of the traditionally accepted version of events, and before long, the story of George Beatty would become essentially our sole topic of discussion, followed by extensive cutting-edge research resulting in a new biography being written. We have since dedicated thousands of hours and pounds to our entirely non-profit project. According to our research, George Beatty was born or baptized on Monday, September the 18th, 1786, a specific date previously unknown. He was the third eldest of seven children born to parents William Beatty and Elizabeth Scott at White Hill on the Kirkside Estate in a croft nestled at the base of the Hill of Morphy in St. Cyrus. George apparently had an exceptionally happy childhood and adored his east coastal paradise. Being a family of crofters and salmon fishers, it was slightly surprising when in 1797 to 1798 the seventh laird of Kirkside, Joseph Stratton, assisted William Beatty and his elder son James to secure government positions as officers of excise initially in our broth. George, his mother, and two surviving siblings ultimately relocated to Montrose around 1800, the town in which he would eventually become a writer, solicitor, and began a very successful law firm, together with being factor to Lieutenant General Sir Joseph Mutter Stratton's Kirkside estate. He grew to be a handsome and extremely happy, generous, and fun-loving man, relatively short and well-built, with black curled hair and dark blue eyes. George Beatty also had a passion for the written word and wrote articles and poems for the local newspaper, the Montrose Review. In 1815, when around 29 years old, he penned what would become his most significant, famous and published poem, John O'Arna, short for Arnhall. This truly epic poem was a satirical comic adventure, 
based on the apparent delusions of a boorish Montrose town officer named John Findlay or Finlay, both names have been cited, which would ultimately be translated into a stage play by Charles Bass and James Bowick in 1826. George was a temperate, practical Christian, primarily known and beloved for his immense kindness and philanthropy in both his personal and professional capacities. He was also a member of the Montrose Club, which was a long-established organization for progressivists, radicals and reformers who railed against the inequality, oppression, injustice and cruelty of the establishment, no doubt inspired by the Enlightenment movement. David Mitchell, in his 1866 book History of Montrose, stated that George Beatty and several of his close friends were a noble band of reformers who prepared the way for the great politician Joseph Hume, MP, 1777 to 1855. George Beatty also ran for town council, but was defeated by a single casting vote. His undoubted abolitionist beliefs would inevitably soon be tested and brought to the fore. The crux of our project and George Beatty's story centers around 1821 to 1823, and his doomed relationship with the daughter of his close friend, a local landowner and gentleman farmer, Squire Robert Gibson, who owned mansions at Stone of Morphy and Geneva. Miss William Gibson was a tall, vivacious and pretty young woman, very pale, light brown hair, hazel eyes. It would appear that George fell in love with her at first sight. As time progressed, a romance blossomed between them, and the terrible fate of George Beatty was sealed henceforth. In the spring of 1823, Miss Gibson, her mother Isabel, née Mitchell, and her uncle James were notified of large inheritances left to them by William Mitchell Esquire of St. John in Grenada, totalling what would be in present-day terms approximately £12 million. Contrary to what George initially believed and the traditional story records, William Mitchell was not a respectable governor of Grenada, but rather an agent for the Mount Nesbitt Estate Sugar Plantation and an owner of over 100 slaves. In their private correspondence, George Beatty and Miss Gibson used selected pseudonyms. Miss Gibson used the name Sarah Bronca or Brunka for this purpose, convincing George that this was the name of her uncle, William Mitchell's black housekeeper. Our research has since uncovered that she was also a millionaireess in her own right and a slave owner, obviously being extremely unlikely to have been anyone's housekeeper or even black for that matter. George was abruptly and inexplicably ousted from his engagement with Miss Gibson and his legal services regarding the Mitchell legacy. He was replaced as a suitor by a socially powerful foppish corn merchant William Smart of Cairnbank, who had previously never shown the slightest interest in Miss Gibson, chosen, without doubt, by her mother Isabel. A subsequent campaign of ridicule and harassment of George then followed, mainly due to his reluctance to surrender intimate and binding correspondence from Miss Gibson. George committed to paper his statement of facts in the hope it may serve to vindicate him from future aspersions or misrepresentations which was to be laboriously hand-copied by many individuals during an apparent 40-year suppression of information imposed by guilty parties. Therein he states, that plots were laid by others to oust me and secure Miss Gibson's fortune. I know well from the inquiries that were made at myself from a certain quarter. Those who inferred were far too many for me. The remainder of this story can only be educatedly speculated on, but the questions must be asked. Why has his true story and literary legacy been ostensibly obliterated from public awareness? Why has disinformation, misinformation and slander regarding George Beatty been adopted and promulgated by at least one local historical society? Why has our non-profit project been totally unsupported and ignored by relevant institutions and organisations. Why do no direct personal effects 
or documents of George Vitti appear to exist? Why did he die intestate only eight days before the end of a 60-day legal validation period after specifically making an elaborate will securing the future of his younger siblings? After several postponements, William Smart and Miss Gibson were married in November 1823. Upon returning from honeymoon, they were met at Montrose Harbour by an angry mob who proceeded to stone and chase them through the town until they finally took shelter in the Star Inn at New Wind. The people of Montrose appear to have had little doubt in their minds regarding those responsible for George Beatty's death. Miss Gibson died in 1840 after two years of illness. She lived a cold, loveless, but privileged life with William Smart and reputedly died whilst calling out for George Beatty, he being ultimately her true love. After the death of Squire Robert Gibson at Caneva House, his wife Isabel resided there alone until her death on Christmas Day, 1845. William Smart had supposedly paid extraordinary attention to his aging mother-in-law and became her sole beneficiary. Our ultimate goal was to secure a permanent and appropriate public memorial to the memory of George Beatty. We have not yet been successful. Chapter 8 Lest the Triumph For at least the past thirty years I have been a conspiracy realist and researcher. The creation of the term conspiracy theorist might well be considered a conspiracy itself, as its acutely negative connotations may be traced to liberal historian Richard Hofstadler. But it was the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, that likely played the greatest role in effectively weaponizing the term. Nothing is as it seems, and the truth is invariably the opposite of what we are led to believe. When choosing the title of this book, I was endeavouring to convey not my triumph over the negative aspects of life, but rather the hope that oppressive forces and events do not triumph over me, or anyone else for that matter. The chains of social indoctrination, whether by church, state or media, must be thrown off, however difficult. Unless we can remove the veils from our eyes and the deceptions, delusions and illusions from our minds, we will never awaken. There is, literally, a matrix of lies and every kind of bullshit which has to be transcended. That is the challenge and mission we came here to face. There is an excellent quote by Dr. Michael Elner which states, Just look at us. Everything is backwards. Everything is upside down. Doctors destroy health. Lawyers destroy justice. Psychiatrists destroy minds. Scientists destroy truth. Major media destroys information. Religions destroy spirituality. And governments destroy freedom. Six media companies exist today. There used to be 88. These six all get their news from Reuters and the Associated Press. Reuters owns the Associated Press, and the Rothschilds owns Reuters. That means a squillionaire controls everything that we will read or see on TV. We can be programmed by this person. Everything we believe, do, feel, want to buy, and want to tolerate can be programmed into us. We are mushrooms. We live in the dark and are fed nothing but shit disguised as knowledge. And so it goes on and on and on. There is no end to the conspiracies that apparently don't exist. It's a circus of fools and psychopaths. It seems that many people can dismiss hard evidence, even when it is right in front of them. The inability to break free from their programming is always due to fear. The matrix can only exist if fear levels are constantly maintained. This is why we are endlessly bombarded with terror propaganda by the establishment media. People rarely think clearly or logically when afraid. 
Some hide behind skepticism and some behind academia, both of which being merely aspects of the establishment indoctrination system. Obviously, everyone is most definitely entitled to their opinion, but if that opinion is perfunctory and superficial, being based solely on hearsay or wishful thinking, then what value does it hold when confronted by opinions based on conclusions derived from collated evidence garnered from decades of active research, contemplation and experience? When it comes to the majority of skeptics, regardless of their establishment, academic credits, the degree of self-exaltation usually demonstrated, and egotistical delusions of superior discernment and judgment possessed, is insanely astounding. Frequently accompanied by smug smirks, they condescendingly deride and belittle the earned opinions and personal experiences of others, pronouncing the assessments and conclusions thereof, flawed and erroneous, thereby blatantly and fundamentally calling these people fools and or liars. The level of narcissism required to achieve such a mindset is truly disturbing. Despite it being obvious that intellectual, academic snobbery, egotistical arrogance and cultivated myopia are inherent in the academic system, which worships at the altar of materialism with its stunted 3D precepts and excruciatingly limited ethereal perceptions, most people succumb to the propaganda and illusion projected. As with the dogma of orthodox religions, where fallibility is historically irrefutable, the projected lie and illusion cultivated and promulgated is infallibility. Those who exist merely to discount and dispel paranormal reality and strive to disprove their own spiritual infinity and all that isn't gross material in nature, being confined to five-sense physicality, are not worthy of adulation or admiration, but rather merit pity and compassionate repudiation. Skepticism is fundamentally based in fear. Closing the minds of people is not a service, it's an injury which can result in profound spiritual consequences. Atheism is no less ridiculous than religious fanaticism. Absolute conclusions of any kind regarding subjects on which one actually knows nothing is ludicrous. As they say, the mind is like a parachute, it always works best when it's open. Anyway, please do your own real research. Nothing could be more important. May truth, honor, integrity and courage always be the virtues we strive for and be blessed to leave this world possessing. This has been Lest the Triumph, a memoir by Barry Dominic Graham, narrated by Peter Baker, copyright 2014, by Barry Dominic Graham, production copyright 2019, by Barry Dominic Graham.